little about me. Uh, my name is Ryan. This is my GitHub and Twitter handle and stuff. Uh, and as a little bit of an advertisement, um, I, I work at Ascribe. Our flagship product is called BigchainDB, which is a blockchain database. And uh, if you're interested in that somewhat controversial topic, you can come back to this room around 4.30 and hear the CEO of our company talk about it. So uh, to get on the same page, we should know what I mean when I say a similar image. Um, these two images are similar. Uh, and we say they have sort of perceptual similarity in the sense that if you were some kind of alien and didn't know what the Mona Lisa was and didn't know what a cat was, you could probably guess that these images are pretty similar. Uh, as opposed to content-based or conceptual uh, similarity, uh, even though these kind of have the same color scheme, you really need to know what a tiger is to, to know that these are two pictures of a tiger in different positions. So our image library is just focusing on the top uh, kind, the simpler kind in some sense, and we're ignoring this content-based uh, similarity. Uh, this has been done before, of course. Uh, you're probably wondering what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm sure you've used Tenai. Tenai is a great Im reverse image search for finding, you know, if you have an image, you can find out where it's being used on the web. Um, there's also this library called phash, which, which um, gives you the perceptual hashes from different kinds of images. Uh, the problem here is, of course, Tenai is a service. It's not open source software, so we couldn't we were limited in how we could build things around it. And phash just provides the image hashing. It doesn't necessarily tell you how to search among a billion plus images. Uh, so in the end, we wrote the whole thing. Uh, also, phash has a, uh, the it's open source, but the license is uh, non-commercial. So we decided to write the whole thing for ourselves from scratch. Uh, the approach we use is based on this paper. Uh, the date's not here. This is from Xerox, uh, early 2000s. It's not particularly bleeding edge, but we couldn't, we, there's like a, a reference implementation of it here, um, but it's quite old code, it's not maintained. So we wanted to be able to use it in Python, of course. Uh, the whole thing that we did is uh, Python, NumPy, and we wanted to be able to use it with modern databases. So the basic idea is you've got some kind of image here, and you need to compute it, you need to change it into something that the computer can understand, which usually means some kind of vector or list of numbers. Uh, and then, of course, you need a way to search it very quickly. So it's not just enough to be able to compare directly to images. You have to be able to find if one image or similar images in your database of a billion images in, you know, around a second or something, or it's kind of not useless for, or not useful for web applications or the end user. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how we generate the image signature based on the paper I showed you. Uh, this is not the only way to make a perceptual hash. Um, and if you've, you've seen this kind of thing before, this should be pretty familiar. If not, it should be hopefully quite interesting. Uh, basically, the first thing we do is uh, get rid of the color data, just make it black and white. So we grayscale. Then we kind of superimpose this little grid on it, and uh, we're actually doing a big data reduction here. We're just getting rid of all the information outside those highlighted grid points. So each one, you know, looks like this kind of meaningless blob of something. Um, then we just zoom in on all those. So we've got, we've reduced this images now to just a bunch of little squares of pixels. Uh, and then we sample it, we just, this is again, just so you know, this is just zoomed in. Um, then we kind of just smooth over uh, each one of those zones and get, you know, one grayscale pixel. So we've reduced this image now to this kind of uh, block of shades. So uh, what do we do with that then? It's still not necessarily something a computer can understand. We have to make the signature somehow. Uh, and the way we do that, again, prescribed by the paper I showed you earlier, uh, is we, we take, we look at one pixel in its neighbors, or one grid point in its neighbors. So you can see we're gonna look at this one highlighted in red and its eight neighbors. Um, then we just, if you can see this arrow, sorry, it's not super clear. There's a little green arrow and a little green number. Um, you can see that this, this um, block it's pointing to from the middle block is a little bit darker. So we encode that as a one. Uh, this one's about the same, so we encode it as a zero. This one's darker. This one's much darker and so on. And we do this at every point. 
And when we combine all these together, we've got um, a bunch of vectors. And then basically, you just flatten the whole thing and you get what the image signature is. So if we're using a nine by nine grid with each of the eight nearest neighbors, you get a 648 dimensional vector. Okay, so what can we do with this? Um, whoops. Oh, okay, it looks different here. Um, so going back to the signature from the last slide, we've got the signature from this image of the astronaut, and of course, this is just a vector, this is just a direction in space. So if I take another image, say this uh, Botticelli painting, I can make a new signature, and then the image difference is just, yeah, the vector difference, or in this case, just a normalized vector dif difference. So you reduce the difference between any two images uh, to a single number, which is very useful. Um, so of course, this, this number means nothing to you if you can't see a few examples. So here's a few um, Mona Lisas. Of course, as we expect, the distance from an image to itself is zero. Um, this next image, maybe you can tell, maybe not from sitting out there, the hue is a little bit different, the color is different, it's, it's another photograph of the painting, maybe taken at a different lighting condition. Uh, then this one is, has a cat, and uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and it's, it's also robust against these kinds of transformations like distortions, um, small rotations, crop, a little bit of cropping, uh, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's a overview of what the uh, different image distances might look like. Of course, that's just the first part. Like I said, we've generated the image signatures, but we need some kind of way to search it. So uh, the way I explain this to uh, people in my company, some of whom were non-technical, was with an uh, analogy of a library. And I'm sure all of you know uh, about the differences between linear and binary search, but I'm gonna use this metaphor anyway just to remind you. So if you had a library of books and you wanted to find a specific book, there's a really stupid way you could look. Uh, you could just look at every book one after another, one per second, and then you've got, you know, if your library has 100,000 books, it's gonna take about 50,000 seconds on average to find any given book, uh, unless you get really lucky and it only takes one second. Uh, of course, the better way is to index this somehow in any, if you've ever used a library or a card catalog or these days, you know, some kind of computer. Um, you know, you look it up by subject, maybe the row, the shelf, blah, blah, blah. So if, if these indexing steps take a fixed amount of time, you generally save a lot of time, right? Because you only have to do a linear search on maybe the shelf, just look down the shelf and find your book. So of course the moral of the story is index your library, or in our case, index your database of images. Um, of course, it's not straightforward how to do that because we've got this huge vector uh, so we have to break it up somehow. So the way we do it uh, is to look, look at it in pieces. So if I look at these first, I guess that's 18 numbers. Look at this first chunk. Uh, we want to convert this into something that's easily indexable. Um, so I'll just go through the algorithm. We chop it up into sections. Uh, we simplify it here. Um, you can see we're kind of compressing the range from uh, negative two to two to negative one to one. This is just to limit the search space, otherwise it's gonna explode. Um, then we make every section non-negative and you just have to bear me with me for a second to see why this is. Um, so we're just adding one to everything to go from zero to two. Uh, then we have three possibilities at every point in the vector. So if I use a base three numbering system, I can get a unique integer if I multiply every power of three times every number in this uh, vector, and that's exactly what we do. We carry out this multiplication, and then you get this unique integer. And the unique integer is exactly what we'll index. And if you know anything about databases, um, indexing on integers is a lot faster than indexing on arbitrary objects, at least in my experience. So these numbers, we do this for, uh, you, you know, it's arbitrary how many you want to do. Uh, we do 63 by default and they can overlap, it's fine. It improves the search. Uh, so these are the indexes. This, this tells you where to find the image and if there's a, a billion images or so. So in our analogy, um, our database, and in our case, we have a driver written for Elasticsearch. Uh, we used Elasticsearch because we also cared about how quickly we could append images, and we found with the small Elasticsearch clusters and a few workers, we could insert 10,000 or so images a second into our um, 
into our log. It's Lucene based, so it's quite fast. Um, so that's in the analogy of the library. Of course, the books and shell or the rows and shelves and stuff are the indexes, and your individual book is your individual image. So uh, I want to say a little bit about the performance. Um, take these plots with a grain of salt. These are from the original paper. Um, the database is quite synthetic. Uh, these are the recall rates, um, but they give you an idea of what this is and isn't robust against. Uh, as I showed you before with the resizing and distortion of the Mona Lisa, since you're superposing and superimposing a grid and taking differences between grid points, um, there's not a huge, you know, you can distort it a lot and still get decent matches. Of course, once you start to rotate it, uh, even by a few degrees, you can put the, uh, those shaded regions in different regions, so it's not as good. Um, the point is, uh, it can, well, the, the point is it's not good against rotation, but it, we do have building capabilities for like 90 degree rotations. It's nothing sophisticated, it just rotates the image and does another search, but that's nice because you don't have to. Um, it's good against cropping and you can even invert the colors, do any kind of flipping, transform, or combination thereof, and it should still find your image. Uh, as for the performance of the lookup and stuff itself, uh, we aim for this logarithmic uh, performance and it does indeed show. Unfortunately, I don't have it up to one billion images. The cluster we're using, we are no longer using, so I didn't have it on. So this is just what I could throw together on my desktop yesterday. Uh, but you can see that the, you can see the logarithm of performance. And if you extrapolate, you know, from one million to 10 million, 100 million, a billion, you're probably still looking at under a second lookup times. Um, so it's quite fast. And uh, yeah. Uh, a couple other projects people have made based on image match. Um, one simply called Match. It's made by some people at Pavlov Machine Learning, which is a company in San Francisco. I don't know much about them. But if you want to deploy this on uh, Kubernetes, if that's what you're into, uh, this is what you want to use. Um, also, another internal project we have um, is basically like Image Match for 3D models. Um, since we have some 3D printing customers, uh, and we've open sourced this as well. So uh, it's nothing. Uh, it's basically image match with a, a Blender plugin that orients whatever model you give it into specific orientations, and then you just search over those images, um, just like they were regular images. Um, one thing I want to add, um, we were surprised at the popularity of this project because we, even when we were building it, we assumed someone had done this before, but we've, you know, put it on Hacker News and Reddit and GitHub and no one's ever told me of an open source version of alternative of image match that exists. So if you know of something during the questions, um, please let me know because I've never heard of it. I uh, want to acknowledge a few people, two, two of whom are here today. Uh, Sylvain uh, is here somewhere. There he is. Uh, Sylvain and Alberto, uh, working at a scribe, uh, helped with the open sourcing of this project. Um, I wrote all the numerical code, but I'm, you know, you know how it can be when you just write the scientific code and you want to open source it and the other developers are like, wait, we've got to actually do something about this or no one will use it. So they made it useful, put it on uh, the Python package in index and smoothed the install and everything. Uh, Andreas Mueller, also here in the back, um, helped us uh, get the clustering and uh, database stuff set up. As I said, it runs on Elasticsearch. But uh, before he got his hands on the project, uh, I initially had it running on MongoDB, which is kind of funny in retrospect. Um, so we never would have gotten 10,000 image insertions a second, anything like that without his help. Uh, for Match3D, I got a lot of help from uh, Troy McConaughey, who uh, helped solve some of the mathematical problems about orienting the uh, 3D models and so on. And uh, yeah, I'm quite a bit under time. <laughs> so I guess I'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, thank you. Um, all the images except for this one were, uh, uh, what's the word, public domain. Um, this one required attribution, so here it is. And uh, here are the links again, and thank you for listening.